everyone, and welcome back to ASP.NET Core 1.0. My name is Steve Bishop, and in this video, we're going to be talking about dependency injection. So in the past, you may have been tempted to compare the development of an application to that of building a house, where you have some sort of foundation, and you've got some base classes in that foundation, and then you've got other classes that are built on top of that foundation. And maybe you add some extra walls and some ceilings and maybe an extra floor and you retile the roof and all that sort of good stuff. And it sounds very logical. But you start to learn over time that this really is begging for a disaster. Because what happens when those base classes form some sort of crack? Now you have to go in there and you have to fix the base classes, but when you fix the base classes and you make changes to the foundation, just like if you try to make changes to the foundation of a house, it's very easy for the house to crumble and fall apart. So you make all your fixes to the base class uh, and then you restructure your house and you get rid of all those cracks and now we look like we're all ready to go and then what happens? Well, the customer comes along and says they want to add another uh, piece to the structure and that ends up causing more cracks in the base classes because those base classes aren't designed to, to withstand some other addition. And then once again, everything falls apart again. And you repeat this process over and over again of things fall apart. You have to ref uh, go back and fix everything, find all the parts in your code that need to, uh, to change to match all the changes you put in your base classes and all the uh, all of the you know flooring and all the structure needs to be fixed over and over again. We just keep repeating this process and it's very, very annoying. So let's take a little bit of a deeper look as to why this happens. Well, let's say you have class A and class A is going to be one of your base classes. So you've got other classes that wrap themselves around class A, right? So you've got this code and you want to adhere to the dry principle. So your base class, class A, has all these properties and methods and all these members that do special things on them. And since you don't want to repeat yourself in class AA, BA, and CA, you just simply inherit from class A. And that's, of course, what we call inheritance. Now, this type of relationship is called an is a relationship. That means class AA is a type of class A. And we could say the same thing about BA and CA. We would say class BA is a type of class A and class CA is a type of class A. Okay, so it's just very important to remember that relationship. It's is a relationship. Class AA is a type of class A. So what then happens when class A has a problem? Well, if you're one of the more experienced developers, you may not want to necessarily go in and change class A. You want to replace class A with say class X, which has all of the different bug fixes. But now class A, A, B, A, and C, A are all kind of useless because they may depend upon all of the way that class A worked, maybe it relies upon all of the side effects that class A has, or the way that the methods work inside of class A, and class X just causes a problem. So now class A, A, B, A, and C, A, either you need to go into each one of those classes and fix the code, or you need to build a whole brand new set of classes to use class X. And then those classes need to replace, uh, you know, need to be replaced for wherever you were using class A, A, B, A, and C, A. So you've got this whole tree, this branching out into all of the other classes that affect all the little nooks and crannies of your code base that could all be affected by this one little change from class A to class X. Now, there's even yet another little problem that comes about, and that is something we've kind of seen a little bit in our controller class, and I've kind of alluded to it. And let's say, for example, our controller classes We've just been instantiating a database context inside of the controller class. Now that database context has been a development database context. Okay, that is, it's a development, it's a context that's based upon a database that resides on my development box. 
Now what happens if in our controller we no longer want to use the development database but we want to use the production database. So we're switching from off of our development environment into the production. Well we can't just keep using the development database context because it's referring back to a database that maybe the production environment doesn't even have access to the development database. Or if it does, boy, that could really cause some problems because now you're making changes to development uh, data when it's in production environments, and that could be a real big problem. But since we hard-coded the database context into the controller class, we can't just simply replace it. I mean, we it, it is okay. I mean, we can replace it, but boy, that whole replacement process means we've got to go through all the lines of code in our controller class and find all of the instances where we've been basing our code off of that database context and replace it now with the production database context. And that's a big hassle. That's, that's a lot of stuff you got to try to find and clear out. Now this gets only worse when you start to think about all of the other controller classes that you've got in your application. My goodness, you've got to go through all of those other controllers that you've got out there in your code base and replace that database context with the production database context. So how does dependency injection fix this? Well, you have to understand that you really need to throw away that whole building a house model in your mind because it really doesn't suit making good decoupled code. And that's really the goal here. We want to have our code not so reliant upon each layer one at a time. Every single part should be basically an add-on. Every class should be built as if it is some sort of add-on that can just be plugged in at any time. So instead of having a, a house built on some sort of structure and some sort of foundation, you need to think more about having this nebulous cloud that is your code base. And this cloud has a bunch of different types of classes in it with different shapes and sizes and colors. Now, you do have to have some sort of business logic or, or business layer. And that business layer has a bunch of classes in it. But rather than being built upon some sort of foundation, these classes just take the parts that they need, take the classes that they need, and those classes get injected into the business logic class. Now, once the business logic class is done using those classes, it will create some sort of result, and that's it. Now, what you've effectively done is you've made it so that those classes, class Z and class C, are really not caring about what they're being injected to. They don't, the business layer class doesn't really care that class Z or class C, uh, you know, what it's called or even really what it does, just so long as the shape matches what it needs. So as long as the business layer class can get a, you know, class that has a triangular shape to it and a class that has kind of an oval with a, a piece missing out of it, well, that's all that the business layer class really cares about. And then it'll re it'll use that. And based upon what's been injected into it, it will spit out some sort of result based upon what's been injected into it and whatever its logic dictates. So how does this dependency injection work? Well, let's say you've got class AA. And inside of class AA, you're going to create some sort of private variable of type interface X. So it just needs to be an abstract class. It doesn't have to be an interface, but interfaces work really, really well. So class AA has a interface X, and that's a very big difference than the is a architecture that we were dealing with before. Now you can have all sorts of different classes that as long as they implement interface X and they have all the same you know, properties and methods that are dictated by having interface X as the class they inherit from. Well, you can inject any one of these classes into class AA and it will work just fine because class AA doesn't really care 
which class you're passing into it, just so long as you are passing a class that inherits from interface X. Now it can set that class that has been injected into it as the private variable inside of class AA. Now that would look something like this. Public class AA controller has a private variable called underscore dependency that is a type of interface X. Now on the constructor for the AA controller class, we can see that there is a parameter here of type interface X called dependency. And we're assigning the dependency parameter to the underscore dependency private variable. Now down at the bottom where we have our index action, we're just calling the do stuff method that should exist on the underscore dependency private variable. So to be clear here, we're saying AA controller has a interface X and it's injected in the constructor. You can see this is really simple by design. We're replacing inheritance with simply a private variable that gets injected into the constructor of the class. And then we can use that private variable inside of the business logic of our AA controller class. Let's hop into our Visual Studio window and just take a quick little demonstration of how this might work. Wait, this isn't my Visual Studio code window. It was Michael Jordan. <laughs> look at the face. So if you take a look at our customer's repository that we built in the last video, you'll notice that we have this private variable called DB and it's of a type AdventureWorks context. Now this private variable, we're instantiating a new instance of AdventureWorks context on it right away. Now anytime that you are instantiating a new instance of a class, you should be asking yourself, is that really necessary? Do I need to instantiate an instance of it at that particular spot? Or could I perhaps maybe just inject it as a parameter to the constructor or maybe to one of the methods? And that's that code smell that I mentioned before. It's got something about it that just doesn't look right, doesn't feel right, and we could really decouple our code if we allowed the caller or the creator of this customer's repository object uh, to just pass that AdventureWorks context in as part of the constructor. And that would really separate our code. That would create some decoupled code. So I'm gonna go ahead and do CTOR to create our constructor. And I'm just gonna say that when this customer's repository gets instantiated, that whoever is creating it or whoever is instantiating it must pass in an instance of AdventureWorks context. And I'm just gonna call this DB context. And we're gonna say DB is going to be assigned DB context. So we're assigning to the private variable, the private internal variable, instead of a new instance of the AdventureWorks context, we're gonna assign it the one that gets handed off as part of the constructor parameter. Now, as far as the rest of the code is concerned, that's perfectly fine, right? Nothing in our customer's repository uh, is failing because we've made this change. So let's go ahead and save that. And now let's go to our customer's controller. And it looks like our customer's controller doesn't like this change. It's got a bug to it. And that's because, of course, now our customer's repository, when it tries to go and be instantiated, it needs to pass in an instance of AdventureWorks context into the constructor. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll just do new AdventureWorks context. Okay, and that makes it happy. And now we've got a, a iCustomers repository variable called repo, and it's of a new instance of customers repository, which has a new instance of AdventureWorks context being passed into it, okay, or being injected into it. And the rest of our code seems to be happy with this change. And in fact, if we go ahead and run our application, we'll find that if we go to the customers section, our index view indeed does work and we can pull up Ruben Torres. 
We could see Ruben Torres' information. We could, of course, make changes or delete the customer, whatever we'd like. So really, those modifications using dependency injection did not affect our code in any way. Now, you may be wondering, well, Steve, when you were in the customer's repository, you saw that new instance of AdventureWorks context and was being assigned to that private variable. And you said that was a code smell and we should probably consider maybe injecting it. But when we look at the customer's controller, we see kind of a similar situation here on the repo object. Could we not inject the customer repository with this AdventureWorks context? And the answer is yes, you absolutely can. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll do CTOR. And instead of, uh, you know, instead of doing a customer repository though, notice that the repo private variable is of a type iCustomers repository. And that gives us a lot of flexibility then, right? We can pass in any sort of customers repository as long as it has an implementation of iCustomers repository. So I'm going to allow whoever is calling this customer's controller or instantiating an instance of customer's controller, as long as it passes in some sort of repository that implements iCustomers repository, I'm fine with that. And we'll call this uh, customer's repository. And we'll assign repo, or we'll assign customer's repository to repo. So. Okay, and now we can get rid of the instantiation of the customer's repository with the AdventureWorks context built into it. Okay, so that should be all fine and good, right? Well, not so fast, because who's calling customer's controller? Well, that goes back to the startup class when we have the use MVC with default route. And as you can see, there's really nothing configurable here that tells us how to pass in an instance of some sort of class that implements iCustomers repository. Well, that's where something comes in called an inversion of control container, okay? An IOC container that they're often called. Now, ASP.NET Core comes with a built-in IOC container. And so in the next video, I'm going to show you how to implement an IOC container in your ASP.NET Core application. Yeah.